everyone. I hope you actually are keeping well. My name is George, Development Officer for Captain Safe Garden here at Watch England. And I would like to welcome you to Watch England first Watch the Beach webinar, local delivery, local Watch delivery. This is the first in a series of three webinars being delivered over the, ne the next few months to support our member clubs with a safe and sustainable return to Boxer, both on and off the court. I am delighted to be joined by this, this, this evening by Boxer's Boxer England competition manager, Rachel Crack, who will be, be providing you with information, tips and advice to support you to deliver a local boxer competition in our area. Over in the next hour, she will be covering topics including event management, health and safety, and adoption rules and, and guidelines. You will also be hearing from Lauren Chancer about her experiences of arranging and delivering a local competition in, the, in Bristol in Bristol at the end of last year. Before we make a start on, it, on this webinar, I would just like to go through a few housekeeping rules. Firstly, please keep your mic, mic muted and cameras turned off after during the presentation. After the presentation, you'll be able to turn our camera on again. And and we'll be invited. Uh, we'll be invited to and might not help if you would like to ask ask a question. If you would like to do so, so now, please use the chat function to introduce yourself. If you require any support throughout the webinar, please drop me a message in the, in the chat box below, and I will do my best to support. And finally. This webinar has been recorded and will be available to us back on Boxer England's YouTube channel. Therefore, if you don't want to be on the recording, please keep your camera turned off throughout the whole, web throughout the whole webinar. We, we want to make this webinar interactive, as interactive for you as possible. Therefore, if you have any questions throughout this webinar, please feel free to pop them in the chat box and make sure will answer as many questions as possible at the end. So I'll now pass it over to Rachel. Rachel, over to you. Thanks, George. So I'm just going to start with um, what do you want from this session? Basically, has anyone got any anything that they've come to this session and and want to um, and want to learn? Just uh, just write in the in the chat box or um, or shout up. Um, there's only a few of us on the on the webinar, so feel free to shout up as to what you might want to get from the session. Right. So my biggest thing is um, this is Roy, and my biggest thing is timings and that sort of thing. And last time we spoke. Um, you know, you said you're going to send me some stuff on timings and things, but if we can cover on today, that's fine. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, any, anyone else? Anything that you've come come here for? I'm um, I'm presuming that um, most of you are interested in actually running a competition. Would I be right in saying that? Yes, uh, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so um, I'm going to cover um, uh, or touch on most competition related stuff. So if, if there is anything that I don't cover, there will be time at the end to, to discuss those points. So make a mental note of any questions. Um, I'm going to be talking through quite a lot and we'll try and keep it interactive. So please be prepared to shout up or raise your hand using the button or the chat box as George mentioned. Um, plus, if you have any questions, feel free to butt in. Um, because chances are the people um, will have the similar questions. So what I hope you will learn over the next um, 50 minutes. Um, 
firstly, um, the steps that you might take to organise a botch competition. So what to consider when organising a disability event. Secondly, the responsibilities involved in arranging a competition. So we'll cover things like health and safety, volunteers, media and comms, that kind of thing. And thirdly, what resources you might be able to utilise on, on the day itself. So we'll talk through a few top tips and let you know what resources Botcher England have on offer to support you to deliver a competition. So um, firstly, I thought it might be useful just to touch on what competition is. Um, when, when you guys think of competition, what kind of things spring to mind? Anyone shout out anything? Kent League. Yep, okay, so types of competition. Um, what do you think competition um, means to the players? Yeah, some, something they can win and uh, they get something at the end, at the end result. Yeah, so um, I guess when, when I think of competition, I think of an opportunity for players to use, maintain or improve their ability and the skills that they've been learning in practice. Um, secondly, is um, the enjoyment. So competition is, should be a place where people enjoy coming together and, and competing to essentially win something, like you say, Roy. <laughs> what um what do you think the benefits of competition are to our botcher players? Updating their level, their mm -hmm. um, the way they uh, they perform. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Learn different tactics. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's definitely two things. Um, I've got down here. Um, so it's pr proven to benefit physically and mentally. So players, um, w their, their well-being and their self-growth. So this might include relieving stress, that kind of thing. There's the social side of it, so encouraging people to meet new people um, who might be interested in the same hobbies. The people with the same hobbies are more likely to have some common ground to talk about, have the same passion. So that's where friendships can be made. Character development, so personal development will be improved by playing competition. Uh, things like independence, responsibility, communication, confidence, that kind of thing. So competing in sports basically teaches people new ideas and tests their ability. Sportsmanship as well. So honesty, that kind of thing, taking part in competition. People understand basic morals and understand what it means to be a fair athlete. And as I'd mentioned before, enjoyment. Playing competition with friends and family can be quite can, is enjoyable, and the thrill of winning. So we're going to start with roles and responsibilities. So your main responsibility um, as a competition manager, competition organizer. Um, this is basically someone who will manage all areas of the competition and ensure the competition is delivered in a safe and enjoyable environment. So this doesn't necessarily have to be one person. Um, you could split responsibilities between you and someone else to help manage the workload. So this is applicable at all levels, really. For, for me, working at Botcher England, I often that other person I share that workload with is Natalie Braisby, our workforce manager. Having another set of eyes to check things is, is really useful when planning a competition. What sort of responsibilities do you think a, a competition manager might have um, when preparing for a competition? Has anyone got any suggestions? Mm. 
brief all the uh, officials. Um, yes, so, yep, volunteers, definitely. Yeah, and um, competition rules, etc., etc. Yep, yep, setting the rules and things. Um, so there's a few um, few responsibilities responsibilities could include booking the venue and um, equipment, promoting the event itself. If you've got a budget for that event, um, making sure that that's monitored. Volunteers, as you mentioned, Roy. Plus catering. and then help manage manage them on the day. And next we move on to competition rules. So a botch competition will need to have some level of rules or guidelines set for players to follow. A summary of main rules can be found on the Botcher England website. And this is taken from the International Botcher Rules, which can be found on the World Botcher website. You can decide on the rules you wish to set based on the type of players the competition is aimed at. We do have some suggestions on recommended rules for certain types of competition. So if you've got a competition that um, you've got new or um, players that have very little experience, you might want to try um, what we call our Botcher 12s format. So it's a two end, two end Botcher competition and players aren't penalized for any viol violations. The next level up we recommend um, for players that have a varied experience of competition. So you could try no violation Botcher, which is uh, more of an educational option. Uh, again, players aren't penalised for violations, but instead the referee or, or a coach will explain the rule and offer a, a friendly warning. And then the third level is the top level competition, which is for players who might be experienced and um, have played in competitions previously. So those sorts of players are probably more likely to want to follow, follow the official botcher rules. However, you can be a bit more flexible with this. Um, so, for example, um, in Team Botcher, the, the new rules now state that we that, the, that there isn't substitutions, but you could allow substitutions if you wanted to. So that kind of thing. A top tip from us is um, if you have limited space um, within the venue, try amending the court size. Um, or if you don't have much time, try reducing the number of ends. Next up, we've got venue and equipment. So um, can anyone suggest what you might need to consider when sourcing a venue for a competition? O overall space for competitors, um, volunteers, yep, officials, parents, mm -hmm. spectators. Yep, Any anyone else? Location. Yep, location. It's important. Definitely with travel and um, those sorts of links. Um, so I've put a few things down here. The accessibility of the venue. So if you've got um, any wheelchair users um, attending the competition or um, other disabilities, you might need to consider the access accessibility of the venue. The space, um, Roy, as you mentioned, is, is really important. Uh, parking, transport links, so linked to location. Um, con conducting a risk assessment is important um, from a venue perspective. Catering options you might want to consider as well. And a top tip from us um, is that most sports halls have badminton court markings as standard markdown on the floor. Um, I don't know if any if any any of you realise that a botch court is similar dimensions to a badminton court, 
Um, and we've got a um, resource on our website which shows you how to adapt a badminton court really easily um, to make a botcher court. I volunteered to set up a hot drink station, hot drink station, um, and you could even sell cakes to fundraise for for your next competition or your or your club. And continuing with um, venue and equipment. So I've split this into kind of four areas: scoring. Um, you don't have to have the official equipment to um, deliver your competition. So you can see down there, we've got referees kits. Um, using a piece of red and blue paper is just as effective as um, having, the, um, having the proper paddles for, for referees. We've also got listed down there scoreboards. Um, it's quite easy to get hold of and also some venues might have them at, for you to actually use um, free of charge is the table tennis score flip over scoreboards. So it doesn't have to be the, the screens like Botcher England use. You can use really simple methods. Um, equipment, so balls. Um, if We can, we can support with you if required. Court marking. Um, so Sorry, most of you know. You I'm reminded of you that I'm in it. Yeah. I'm going to go cut this. Oh, did I? I'm hoping to go. Okay. I'll, I'll go back 10 seconds, shall I? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so I'll just go back to scoring. So um, you don't have to have the official um, equipment for um, scoring. So with, with things like referees kits, you can use a piece of red or blue paper. Um, it's just as, just as effective as the paddles that referees use. Um, botcher equipment, so ball sets. Uh, we don't expect everyone to have a 10 ball sets in their, in their garage or anything like that. So if you need support, um, with getting hold of equipment, ask your local clubs, um, or if you're really struggling, ask Botcher England. We might be able to support where where we can. Court marking. Um, so most of you know you can get court tape from Botcher England, but if you don't um, have the budget to buy the court tape, it's, it's just as effective to use uh, masking tape or um, or throw down markers, anything like that, just to set the boundary of the court. And the, the fourth area is um, tables and chairs. So the general setup of the hall. Um, if you're using a large hall, they might be split up by curtains or rebound boards. So um, decide, visit the venue and, and, and liaise with the venue to, to decide what kind of setup you want so that you um, can utilize the, the space most effectively to work for your competition. And next stuff, we've got health and safety, everyone's favourite subject. Um, so the words health and safety often make people panic a little bit, but it really shouldn't. In really simple terms, you just want to limit any risk to everyone attending your competition. There's a couple simple things you can do in advance to ensure this happens. What kind of health and safety points do you think you should be considering when running a competition? Has anyone got any? suggestions. So one thing you can do to control that risk management 
is conduct a risk assessment. There's a risk assessment available on the Botcher England website. That's really easy to get hold of. And the main points are checking for hazards, really. So where people might slip, trip or fall, as well as ensuring that all the fire exits are clear. When I walk into a competition venue, it's um, one of the first things that I check is fire exits and if there's anything lying around that shouldn't be lying around. In England, venues will have their own risk assessments of their sports areas. So request a copy of this and it will save, save you half the job. Just make sure you um, re record any incidents or accidents that might happen. Again, we've got a template that you can use for this on the Botcher England website. So just make sure you've got a, a printed copy or access to somehow of recording anything that might happen. Safeguarding is another area of popped under health and safety. So all clubs, all Botch England clubs should have a safeguarding point of contact that you might know as a club welfare officer. So you could ut utilise someone from another club to be your named person for safeguarding. If you aren't aware, George is our Botch England safeguarding lead. Next, we move on to volunteers. Volunteers are the lifeblood of any event, in my opinion. Um, just make sure you set out clear responsibilities to your volunteers and they will ensure your competition runs smoothly. Here's a list of volunteers you may, you may need to appoint for, for your competition. So referees, event assistants, maybe someone to look after media or photography, that kind of thing. And then maybe someone to be at an info point in case anyone has any questions. Rem remember to think about what you might want volunteers to wear on the day of your competition. Even if you don't have budget for branded uniform, you could ask them all to wear the same color, for example. And another top tip from us is um, remember that volunteers, particularly referees, will need breaks. So at Botcher England, we often consider a two matches on, one match off rule just to make sure that people have the chance to have a break. Botcher England are in the final stages of producing a volunteer guide, which will help you recruit, maintain and develop volunteers for competitions um, and in your club settings. So make sure you look out for that. So next up, we've got creating that competition atmosphere. So how do you make your competition feel different to your usual club setting or club practice? So the look and feel of your event, you could consider things like having a clear information point so players and volunteers know where to find out information. You could also consider creating a field of play area. So where possible, set up your match courts in the same, same area. And then maybe have a separate area for, um, for practice or training if you, if you have, have that option. Also, you could create a spectators area. So a designated area for spectators so that they don't disturb matches that might be in play. This doesn't have to be separate or all in one place. It could simply just be around the end of each court. So it's um, quite flexible. Consider inviting the media and what communications you might, might be able to do as part of your competition. So competitions are really perfect opportunities to create awareness of the sport of botcher. So as a competition organiser, you could 
promote your competition using leaflets, flyers, emails, communications with local schools and clubs, using social media networks um, and, and getting in touch with local press, as well as through Botcher England, we have a, a wide net network of through social media and different channels. To learn how to use local press and social media effectively to promote your competition, we've got a media guide for clubs available on our website, so make sure you check that out. Also consider what you can do around the awards presentation once your competition finishes. So create a presentation area, and that could simply be a, a table with a tablecloth on, which you might be able to get from the venue itself um, and mark out a, a simple area with some tape or, um, or throw down markers. So the next couple of slides are all things to consider under competition admin. So things like formats, um, scheduling, scheduling matches, results. So this is the bit where you might want to throw in some questions. So please, um, please butt in if you if you do have anything that pops up. So Boccia, um, as most of you know, can be played across three competition types. So individuals, pairs, and teams. You may want to decide um, that your competition is specifically for individuals or for pairs or for teams, or you might want to cover two out of those three or, or all three. Um, you'll need to decide that um, ahead of sending out entries. Once you have a date confirmed and the venue confirms, you can, you can open up your entries. So create a simple entry form to ask for information like name, classification, contact details, preferably an email and a phone number so you can contact people on the day of competition if, if, if needed. The competition types can be played by eight botcher classes, which typically create the divisions of play. The botcher classes help to ensure players with simil similar levels of disability play on a level playing field. If your players don't know which class they are, then please check out our new self-classification guide, which can be found on the Botcher England website. And if you don't have enough players in, in one class or your players don't know which classification they are, or you don't want to run a competition that's, that splits the divisions of play by classification, it's absolutely fine to, to mix up your divisions. Um, so if you want everyone just to mix everyone up into different groups and play a competition, there's nothing stopping you doing that. If you do have um, rampers attending the competition, I'd um, recommend splitting rampers and throwers, but if that's not possible, it's still absolutely fine to combine everyone into one, one competition. So once you have your list of entries, you may need to divide those entries into groups. So as mentioned, this could be based on their disability or class. We've got some resources available, which um, which I'm going to make available after this this webinar. So one one of those resources is our pool groupings template. So this basically provides a list of the number of players and how you might split those into different groups. match format so this is around the number of ends or time per end you might use so as mentioned before we have a bunch of 12s formats you can use two ends um, you can play to three ends four ends five ends six ends you can set it up however you wish to set it up that works for you based on the time and space that you have 
you can also play around with the time per end. So if you're really limited on time, you can set your ends to only be only allow three minutes per end, for example. There's lots of different ways to, to, to set the format of, of the competition. The schedule of play. So we've also got a resource which we call our pool matches document. So this lists out the matches based on how many players you have in each pool grouping. So if you've got five players in a group, it lists out which, how many matches and what order to play those matches in so that you don't get two players playing at the same time. I use, I, I never remember these, these orders. So I'm always referring to this template. Really useful. So when you get down to the matches that started playing, you'll need to start recording results. So where you can, I would recommend printing score sheets to record the results of the matches. And again, we've got templates for that available on our, on our website for score sheets, which you're able just to print off and use. If you're not able to print off score sheets, again, that's fine. Just have some pieces of paper on hand so that the referees or whoever's um, recording the score can write it down somewhere to pass to whoever needs to record it. Botcher England have also got some really useful Excel spreadsheets which allow you to input scores and work out how many games are won by each player and puts them in, in an order which, is, which are really useful and we've got them ready to share with you if needed. Uh, a top tip with, with scheduling is to give each player a number or a letter to make scheduling easy to amend on the day. If you assign a number or a letter to a player, you can easily change the names of those numbers or letters and your schedule will stay exactly, exactly the same. Saves a lot of time. And post-competition, so following completion of your competition, don't forget to share results with players and teams that took part. Share your photos and videos via social media platforms. And most importantly, give yourself a big pat on the back. If you find certain things don't work out on the day, don't stress about it. Just think, just make a note of it for next time, or you can contact uh, be me or our competition at Botcher England email address to discuss any improvements or um, or if you need any extra support in certain areas to improve it for next time. There are lots of people delivering Botcher competitions around the country, all in different ways. So the more we can share what works and good practice, the better. We've got an opportunity now to hear some feedback on delivering a local competition. George is asking Lauren Kiancha some questions about a competition she delivered last year. Thanks, Rachel. Now I'm joined by Lauren Kiancha from Bristol, who last year arranged a local boxer competition for the clubs in her local area. Lauren has kindly, kindly agreed to share her experiences of delivering a local competition and share her advice this, e this evening in Riverwood. Thank you for joining us, Lauren. I did have a few quick questions here that, that I would like to ask you, if that's okay. So, my first question is, Please, can you tell me a bit about your back to boxer local competition? So, where, 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 where,
yeah thank you for having me um so i hosted um a competition in bristol so it was on my doorstep which was nice um and it was back in october now i think towards the end of october um last year and we had a mix of athletes came um mainly local athletes a couple that traveled a little bit further um but most of them most of the athletes that attended were part of the um gladiators academy so they they were all quite familiar with working with each other um there were a couple of extras that we invited from from the local area um from clubs um so they they may have had sort of teammates from their club that were also competing um but on the whole it was players that i'd worked with before um and knew each other pretty well um or i'd been on a court with them since the pandemic sort of eased a little bit and we were able to get back on a court so um yeah i think for me that was quite important having having that group that were kind of familiar with each other and the area a bit more so yeah it was quite small but i think we probably had around 10 athletes i think yeah quite 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 a good number of athletes competing yeah yeah so so moving on what what were your successes and highlights from the event so what went well and more importantly, what did you enjoy the most about running this competition? Yeah, I think I think we'll probably come on to it, but there were plenty of challenges. So the, the fact that the competition was able to, to go ahead was in itself a success for me. Um, the fact that we, we were able to host it um, and actually it ran pretty much to time. I think that anybody that's run, run a competition before will know that that's obviously a big success when, when that happens. Um, you know, we, we finished on time, we started pretty much on time. Um, so that's always nice. Um, but I think the biggest thing for me, obviously the high, the biggest highlight and the thing that I enjoyed most was being able to get everybody back in a hall. Um, you know, obviously to be able to host a safe competition where we could have more than two athletes in a hall was, was pretty special. It was the first time I'd been in a hall with anybody, well, with more than one athlete at a time. Um, you know, and the fact that we could do it in a way that you know, made everyone feel safe and comfortable. Um, it, it did feel special. Um, and it was, yeah, for me, that was the highlight, still is the highlight. Um, yeah. And I suppose after Shadow being off court, it's a, it was just nice to see everyone do the game. Yeah, hopefully... yeah. Have the social side of it as well as, you know, playing, because mm. that was the biggest thing for us, I think. You know, there wasn't obviously any pressure on the competition, I hope. You know, it, it was obviously a friendly event. It was a back to botch. It was sort of easy back in and it was, um, yeah, it really felt like it was a, a celebration in some ways, you know, to all be able to to spend some time in a hall again. So, yeah. So, I've really touched on that a minute ago. But what, what changes, if any, did you face when arranging the competition? Yeah, so, again, as with any any event that you plan and, run there's always things that you don't expect to happen um so aside from sort of the the covid stuff which in itself was a challenge i'll come back to that a little bit but um the competition was held on the saturday and i was at the venue on the friday night until gone five o'clock measuring out the hall and making sure that i could actually fit four courts in there because they had a leak in the roof um which basically meant that I mean, it was almost like a swim. It wasn't a swim pool. That's a bit dramatic. But they had like loads of tarpaulin across pretty much a whole badminton court being held, propped up by benches. And, you know, they had weights holding down the, the tarp and bins dotted around this, this area um, where the leak was just, well, it had been pouring. It was thankfully okay at that point. We were I'd, I'd spoke to them earlier in the week and they said, we've got a bit of a problem. And I thought, okay, yeah, fine, we can deal with that. And then when I actually got there, I was like, okay, yeah, you mean a, a problem? Like, um, you know, there, there's actually quite a lot of water here. Um, so, yeah, we, we had some long conversations and, you know, like I said, it was potentially not even going to happen. So um, that was one challenge. Um, and like I said, that was right up until, you know, even until Saturday morning when I got there, in some ways we had to hope that, there wasn't much rain on the Friday night um, so that it was still manageable in the morning. But obviously the COVID stuff, it wasn't a, 
a it felt like a challenge because I obviously wanted to make sure that everything was done properly and following the guidance that Botch England have set out and obviously the government guidance as well. Um, so that for me felt like there was a lot of pressure on it. Um, but actually once I got into it and again, working with athletes that I know quite well, it actually made that challenge a little bit easier to manage. Um, so obviously making sure that the distancing was followed, that I had space in between each court, which again was a challenge having a third a quarter of the court even, um, of the hall unusable. Um, you know, so having making sure the space was there, masks, distancing, enough space where people could sort of be out of the way when they're not on court, not in people's way, um, having enough cleaning products and making sure that the loos were usable and not being used by others and all of all of the usual stuff I guess and I and also the stuff that we've also become quite accustomed to having to factor into to day-to-day -day sort of day trips or you know work or school or anything so yeah. yeah that, that, that was quite a big challenge we had to overcome. Um, yeah it is how that and organising these you've got to expect the unexpected and prepare for any any situation. Yeah, definitely. I'm not sure how you prepare for dealing with a a quarter of the hall being a swimming pool, but I mean I could I know what to do next time. Um yeah. but yeah, like you said, yeah. expect expected because anything yeah. can happen and it's not yeah. just COVID that can throw a spanner in the works. So definitely. Yeah. Um, you touched on it a minute ago about about COVID. But can you elaborate a bit more about what COVID protocol you had in place to keep everybody's head and also how how were these received by the players on the day? Yeah, so before before the event happened, obviously we sent out all of the information um and all of the sort of procedures that we'd be following throughout the throughout the day. And we all had to test before, I think it was on the day, either the day before or on the day of the competition. And um everybody did that. Um, and the results had to be sent to one of the Botch England numbers or email addresses, one or the other. Um, and Rachel collated all of that and sent me the list of who'd submitted their results and who hadn't. So I then had to chase up those on the day that hadn't yet sent the result and make sure that that had been done and see proof of it, basically. Um, and if they hadn't done it, they would have had to go and do it before they could come into the venue. Um, but actually, everybody, everybody followed everything that was asked. Um, and like I said, I think now, I think we're all quite familiar with with the stuff that was put in place. So the distancing, the masks, the I think the the biggest thing that people weren't used to was obviously moving out of the box when you're not playing. Um, but again, once you sort of sit back and watch the first round, and there were a couple of athletes that you just had to remind or assistants you had to remind, and it was a challenge at times. But I think just if you you can foresee things like that being a problem because you know that some may not have ever used that before. Um, so it's just being aware and having that time to step back and watch. But everybody was really good at following the assistants, the staff, um, parents, everybody that came had to do a test and everybody, everybody did. Um, so yeah, that it was it was quite easy actually, thankfully. Yeah. And everybody was happy to follow it. And, and, and finally, what tips or advice would you give to anyone looking to arrange and deliver a local bottle of competition in, in their area? Yeah, so for me, I think the biggest thing that I'm thankful that I did consider um, was using a venue that I know very well. Um, obviously, considering the problem that we had with the swimming pool. Um, the fact that I, I was able to use, it was my old school, so having having a venue that I'm very familiar with, um, sort of how they work, how the staff work, and obviously the staff know me, um, it was quite easy to, to get updates, I guess, on the situation there, um, to, to find out how, how the swimming pool was developing sort of day by day, and then obviously the day before when things we thought things were maybe gonna not go ahead, it was, it was really easy to get that communication and reassurance actually from both sides I think that you know we could still make it happen um so yeah I, I don't think we can sort of underestimate the the value of relationships between 
events and events organizers ngbs whatever um and and the venues themselves um and so for me that's that's definitely a top tip use a venue that you know and trust um and then for me again was using actually inviting athletes that i know that i could trust as well um so having athletes that i were either familiar with the rules or i knew would pick them up easily and not have a problem with it um who would come with volunteers who would actually be able to help me ensure that the day ran as smoothly as possible as well um being familiar with that group and having that having a group that already had a good relationship and you know we always have a good atmosphere and a good community with the with the academy group that actually everybody was quite happy to step in and and just do the things that needed doing before they even needed to be done if that makes sense we could just read read the event pretty well because we were used to working with each other um so for me that was really important as well as having having people around that i could trust um and rely on so yeah thank you for those tips Alan. and thank no you for those and thank you for those brilliant answers it's very interesting to hear about your competition in Bristol last, last year thank and thank you again for joining us for the interview it's much appreciated no and I'll, pa I'll pass you back over to Rachel for the rest of this part of the webinar thank you So um, following this webinar, um, I'm going to um, be sending you um, a new guide that we've pulled together on competition delivery, which basically expands um, on what I've talked through today. Um, plus, we have some funding available for clubs or organizations to deliver local competition. So there'll be a bit more information on that too. If there is anything in the meantime um, that you need or um, any anything you think of after this webinar, then please com uh, contact the competition at botcherengland.org.uk email address um, I have access to that um, inbox as well as a couple other colleagues so someone will pick it up and uh, get back to you uh, that brings us to the end of um, that section so just going to open up um, the floor for any questions um, that anyone has on any, on anything I've covered. I'm just going to have a quick look um, in the chat just to see if there's any questions in there. Um, I'll just have a look at the chat first. Um, okay, it doesn't look like any questions were in there. So um, please feel free to uh, speak up now and ask anything and I'll try and answer the questions for you. Right, so you um, you mentioned tape, and yeah. um, I and you said if you haven't got any of the Botcher England tape or anything else like that, use any other tape. But it must be low low impact tape because I I've, I've used that tape before and I've spent hours trying to get it off the floor. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's a good point, Roy. Um, yeah, yeah wow. don't don't go putting gaffer tape on a sports hall floor <laughs> because I've done that before back in the day as well, and it's yeah. a nightmare. So yeah, definitely low tack stuff. Um, often masking tape um, it doesn't stick like it's designed to get you know when you're wallpapering and things and doing DIY, isn't it? So it comes off quite easily. So I'd recommend the masking tape yeah. um, as an option. Yeah, and thank you very much. You you've ticked a lot of boxes for me and everything else. Nice to be in contact, and hopefully see you soon. Yeah, thanks, Roy. Thank you, Rachel, for that fantastic presentation, and thank you all at home for attending this evening. I hope you have enjoyed the webinar, and you now feel more confident to deliver a local a local competition in our area. Before we finish this evening, I would just like to remind everyone of our second part of the beach webinar, supporting club engagement and inclusive community.
communication which is being delivered on HTTPM on Tuesday, the 15th of February. For this webinar, you will be joined by members of Activity Alliance's partnership team who are supporting you to use their 10 principles to engage with more disabled people at the Boxes Club. The link to, the link to put or keep play on this webinar is going in the chat box in a minute. And for those of you are watching this webinar on YouTube, I, I will have put the link in the, in the dis description below. I look forward to seeing you there. But until then, I hope you all stay safe and keep well. Thank you and good night.